Yeah, indeed, we're going to have a slight change of pace. We've had atomic energy and diamonds, and uh, my name is Eric, and I have mostly been studying dung. <laughs> in fact, my first job was as a farm vet in Wales, and on my patch was this lovely lake, Clinavan Vach. And the legend associated with this lake is that a lady arose from it and lived for a time among the people of a village called Madhvai. And then she went back. She didn't like the weather, obviously. <laughs> but she left two things. She left her cattle, because of course she brought her own cattle. And they're the uh, ancestors of the white par cattle of Denevul. And she left also her knowledge of healing, which she passed on through the generations to her descendants, who became known as the physicians of Madhvai. And they became the royal physicians, they were very famous. They healed people through herbalism and animals too. And in this area, I realized very quickly, there's a great respect for traditions, traditional ways of managing animals, traditional ways of healing animals. And I was constantly faced bringing science-based veterinary medicine to this environment with the need not only to make that compatible with traditional ways of managing animals, but to align it so that it's part of the same way of thinking. And nearly 20 years later, this is still the biggest challenge in my research, probably, and the application of my research. So farmers, as long as they have been farming, have known about parasitic worms. It's very difficult to ignore that if you see it. <laughs> this is the gut of a horse with roundworms inside, and they're a bit blurry on the edge because they were moving when the photo was taken. So farmers know about worms, but they also know about the effect of worms. This is an experiment that was done about 50 years ago with six lambs that were grazed through the grazing season at normal commercial stocking densities, and three were given dewormer every three weeks, and three were not. And I'll leave you to guess which three were dewormed. The fact is, it is impossible to commercially produce animal products from grassland without controlling worms. Something we've forgotten because we've had the drugs to do it. And as we intensify now and we need to produce more food without more land, we talk about intensifying agriculture. If we do that, put more animals together, Parasites can find new hosts more easily, transmission increases, parasite burdens increase, and we get more parasite problems. Eventually, of course, we can house the animals, and then parasite problems go down. We have all sorts of other problems. Food feed competition, welfare issues, different diseases. So where my work deals with is, is actually the, the Green Arrow region, where we're trying to intensify uh, animal production from grassland systems. The only way we can manage that is to control the worms. And luckily, we have the drugs to do it. So we can deworm sheep every three weeks, as is often done in this sort of environment, and they will continue to grow. Bad news, though, you know what I'm going to say next. We've used these drugs for so long, so indiscriminately, that they don't work so well anymore. We did a study last year on about 40 sheep farms in Wales, and we tested the effectiveness of the four commonly available active drugs against roundworms in sheep. The group in amber here, one, two, or three of those drugs did not work as well as it should. The four farms on the left in red, none of the available drugs worked as they should, and those farms have serious problems. The four farmers in green, looking on rather smugly, are the ones on which all the drugs still work. So this is a big challenge in farming, drug resistance among parasites. We hear about antimicrobial resistance. This is not such a concern for human health, but it's a concern for whether we can continue to produce animal products from grassland. And this is a global problem. So what do we do now? Well, let's try and pick up where we left off before these drugs came into being 50, 60 years ago. What did farmers do then? Well, they worked with the weather. We know that the parasite life cycle is very dependent on weather. So here we have eggs, parasite eggs, that are deposited in the dung. They develop through to larvae that are infective. Here you see some larvae in a drop of water. 
and they're ingested, eaten by the cattle or the sheep or the goats or the horses. And this part here, the red part, development of larvae from the eggs, the survival in the environment is highly, highly dependent on temperature and rainfall and moisture to a huge extent. If we know how that relationship works, we can predict when pastures become dangerous. We can predict when they become safe again. And farmers used this knowledge. They might not have known all the life cycle detail, but they knew that if you keep animals too long in a pasture, it gets dangerous. They, they knew how long it was before they could use those again. The problem with that knowledge is it's empirical. It's based on past experience, and it relies on those relationships being constant, and they're not. They're non-stationary relationships. As climate change takes hold, we're entering territory that we haven't seen before, and so we can't rely on that tradition, even if those traditions are still in existence. What can we do to help? Well, I'll give an example. Nematozyris, which causes spring scour in lambs. This is a, a quite an odd parasite because it develops in, within the egg into a larva, and the larva then hatches out of the egg. So, so brown egg and larva hatching. And to get it to do this in the lab, we have to put it in the fridge for a month first. This is not a lab fridge, in case the health and safety people are here. <laughs> we put it in the fridge for a month, and then we bring it out into spring-like temperatures, and it hatches. And this is a great adaptation by the parasite to make sure that it encounters naive lambs, not naive as in gullible, well lambs are very gullible, but immunologically naive. So instead of infecting animals that are gaining immunity through the grazing season, this parasite waits until the following spring, until these lambs are starting to graze, and then all the larvae hatch. This is the consequence. about 10% mortality in affected flocks. And if you open the intestines of these lambs, you'll find what looks like cotton wool, and you tease that out, and it's thousands, sometimes even millions of worms, and close up, that's what they look like. And it's not that each worm is particularly dangerous, it's just that the, the life cycle is synchronized, so they all emerge at the same time. That's what's dangerous. But we know from about two years of intensive lab work, in this case, exactly what temperatures are required, so we know that it needs four weeks below 11 degrees and then a temperature window between 11 and 18 for two weeks. So we know those parameters. So we can now predict when those pastures are dangerous. And this has changed. So in the not too distant past, in the southwest of England, hatching occurred fairly reliably within a two week block. Each year was different but hatching occurred sometime in the second half of April. Since then, we've seen a huge change. So not only has spring advanced in some years, so the hatching occurs in February, but it's highly variable between years. It can vary by as much as 12 weeks now. In Scotland, it hasn't changed so much, but it's much later. So in any given year, the hatching date of Nemesis Iris in different parts of Great Britain can vary by about 10 weeks. And in one place in the southwest of England, on one farm, it could be any time in a 12-week window. And yet farmers will circle a date on the calendar quite often and say, that's when I'm going to treat for it, because that's planning and that's organized. It doesn't work anymore, and we're seeing more disease as a result. So what we did with our lab results was, well, turn it into a basic risk model, we put it online, and then where farmers can, can wonder in the spring whether they're at risk, they can note the nearest weather station and say, it's turning red, I need to look out for nematodirus. If I can move the lambs off risky pastures, I will. If not, maybe that's when I should treat. So it's useful to target treatment. Colleagues uh, in the same group have developed more sophisticated models. For example, this is blowfly strike in sheep. So these are the green bottles, which lay eggs on soiled fleece or abrasions on the skin, and the eggs hatch and turn into maggots, and the maggots eat away at the flesh, and none of you are going to want dinner tonight. <laughs> but it's much worse for the sheep. So this is a complex computer simulation model, which includes details of the, the fleece length and other risk factors, including roundworms, which cause diarrhea, which make the fleece dirty, and also details of the flies. And it's quite good at predicting when the risk periods are. We can use that to, to predict the effects of climate change. And what we see if we just 
warm up the temperature in this model is a, an earlier peak. So an earlier peak of risk, particularly for ewes that have overwintered with long, wet, heavy fleeces, and we predict that those will be more affected. However, if we shear them early, we can make that peak disappear. So this shows two things. It shows, firstly, that even very dramatic effects of climate change on disease systems can be attenuated by targeted changes in husbandry. Secondly, it shows that if we have these simulation models and they work well, we can investigate new ways of controlling diseases without having to go through the trial and error and all the loss and suffering that that entails. So, all well and good. But we've heard a few times how climate change is not acting equably across the world. What about these populations? These are goats in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Not a very planned system. You spend the night in a kraal and then they will in an enclosure and then they'll graze the hills. But huge variability in challenge from worms. Worms affect livestock the world over and here it's largely driven by rainfall variability. Are these people really going to use these, these sophisticated models? How do we deliver that for targeted parasite control? Do we even want to encourage communities like this to treat with chemicals to get rid of worms when we know that that's unsustainable in the long run? And I put you on the other side, can we really do nothing when these goats are affected by worms? They're still grazing the arid landscape, they're still producing greenhouse gases, but the worms are taking all the produce and the people are suffering as a result. So can we really do nothing? Well, we're having a go. And one phenomenon we can take advantage of is the fact that not all sheep are equal, not all goats either, in terms of parasite burden. This graph shows the parasite burden and the number of animals that have that burden. So we can see that most of the animals in any group in any group of animals grazing, will have few parasites. And most of the parasites are concentrated on only a few hosts. So some of you will have a colored card under your chair. If you'd look for it now, please, and be my volunteers. It's not all of you, it's just a few of you. If you could hold that aloft, please, it's got a number on it. So you are my goats. <laughs> so you can see that the number on that would be the number of thousands of worms that you have in your gut. <laughs> Some of you not very well. The 86 there, I might put you down. So the color of the card represents how pale you would be because these worms in the tropics suck blood. If you have high worm burden, you tend to be paler. Not always, but you tend to be paler. So if those people with white cards who are very pale just put your cards down, I can tell you that by treating those animals only, I have only treated maybe one in 10 of you, but I've reduced by 80% the number of worms in that group. And that means not only I've helped you individually, but the infection pressure for everybody else has decreased by taking those out of circulation. Put that down, please, it's not an auction. we have finished with that part. <laughs> Thank you. So, so this is what we've tried to do, and with colleagues in South Africa, we've used a system that, that they've developed that we've had to refine. It's called a famature chart, and this is just a little color chart. You can see going from red, nice and healthy, to very pale. You hold it up against the eye of the goat, and if it's pale, you treat it. This is us in Botswana teaching people how to do this, and in the middle of that, there is a goat. They're very keen, and it's easy to use. You don't need to be literate. There's no real gender hurdle or education hurdle or age hurdle. And we tried this in about 40 farms in Botswana. We found that uh, we went back after we taught them. We came back after a year. About a third of them had uh, ignored the advice and were treating all the goats all the time and thought this was great because the woman was free. About a third hadn't bothered at all, and about a third, just by chance, had been doing it as we taught them. And those who uh, had selectively treated their goats had uh, saw, witnessed uh, an improvement in goat health and production that was equal to the groups that treated animals all the time. But they used about 25% of the drug. Be 
Because they're not treating all the animals, we're not going to get such selection for resistance, so this is more sustainable. So we think this is uh, uh, worth pursuing, and uh, so we're going to try, we are trying it in other parts of the world. Uh, so I was out earlier this year in Kazakhstan, and uh, it's a vast steppe land. Animals are extremely important. Horse is actually extremely important, not only for their meat, but milk, horse milk is a staple. And we're told we should uh, give up eating animal-derived products, and then we'll all save the world. If these people did that, they could not live there. They would leave and join the urban poor. So we're trying this in rangeland areas where reliance on animals is very high. And we're working more with the kids, well, the, the children and the gold kids, actually. But we're working with the children. In Kazakhstan, they have a very structured education system, post-Soviet education system. And, uh, and so we can work through that, actually, to teach the children, who then all help with the animals, how to apply this sort of system. So where else can we reach? How far can we reach? Well, we can even try it in Europe, actually. So we've tried it in France. I was in the Netherlands this morning trying to design a system that can work in the Netherlands. And we might even try it in Devon. <laughs> but it, it, it's not just about targeted treatment. Now, what has this got to do with the models, you are probably asking? It seems to be a, a dumbing down or simplification because we can't get models into these areas. That's not true. Because this is a, a meeting in, in KwaZulu Natal, and because people will only treat the animals if they achieve a certain score on the card, if they log that information somehow, the scores of all the animals every time they check during a high risk period, and they take a photo of that and send it to us, we're getting real live data on the parasite challenge in a variable rainfall environment. We can also feed back to them because we've been texting them saying our model says it's getting risky, start checking your goats. We're doing that manually at the moment. Maybe we can automate it. South Africa, the first country in the world where the number of mobile phones exceeds the number of the fixed lines. Very, very tech savvy. Everyone has access to a phone. So in the past, we haven't worked like this. The blowfly strike simulation you saw took 15 years to develop. And if we try to apply that to a new area, there's a lot of responsibility on us to get that right. So, we want to do a study, really, and do a trial and measure things in the field. And because the interannual differences are so huge, we have to do that over a number of years. And no one's getting any benefit, and it's costing a lot of money. This is a way of maybe putting that technology in the hands of the people very early, engaging them in the development of the models, and we're refining our approach to local conditions in line with existing husbandry with the farmers as participants. So that's our, our vision. That's what we want to do. further advantage of doing this is as soon as these farmers had hands on the animals and they weren't used to really looking at, they picked up other diseases and they started to trim overgrown hooves and notice when animals were sick. This is a saiger antelope and saiger antelopes are in Kazakhstan and a couple of other countries. They come together in spring into mass aggregations to carve and last year a lot of them died. So the ecologists who were monitoring carving were confronted with this scene. Aggregations of up to 90,000 animals. And as soon as animals seen sick, hours later it was dead. And within five days, you have 100% mortality of up to 90,000 animals. One of the, it's the most dramatic mass die-off in a wildlife species known. Within three weeks, more than half of the global population of endangered cyber antelopes was dead. And it's a bit of a funny spring in terms of weather. But some of the livestock got sick as well, but no one really took much notice. So if we'd had that kind of system looking after parasites, which are always present, always an issue, affect productivity, and farmers are more engaged in managing those, would they see things like this, which should concern us all? And would we have more global benefits from having engaged farmers in this way? So to conclude, worms work by the weather, so can we. But unfortunately, the traditional empirical approaches have got disconnected from, from new climates and the changing conditions. And we don't want to replace them with science. We want to recalibrate them. And we can perhaps do this realistically using fairly complex models, but in a way that, uh, that I've described. So I'd like to thank our funders and collaborators, not all of whom are listed, and thank you for your attention.